The wife of a celebrated chef and restaurant owner disappeared. He said she left him. What happened next stunned their community. Deep within the VN's household in Lomita, Southern California, lurked a slew of sinister secrets. A den of drug dealing, alcoholism, and domestic violence. But on one ominous October night in 2009, all hell broke loose and Don Viennes vanished without a trace. When the investigators finally uncovered the truth behind her disappearance, the revelation would send shivers down the spines of even the most seasoned homicide detectives. What was the reason behind Dawn's disappearance? How did the investigators solve the case? Hi, and welcome to Real Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and mysterious cases from across the globe. And today we are looking at the disturbing case of Don Viennes. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing to get the latest crime stories directly to your inbox. Without further ado, let's dive deep into the story. Today's case takes us to Lomita, which is Spanish for Little Hill, a city in the state of California. With a population of just over 20,000 people, it is one of the smaller cities in the state. Like most places in California, it has a warm and welcoming climate. It has many popular attractions, including the South Coast Botanic Garden and the Lomita Railroad Museum, making it well worth a visit. But it was here that a horrific crime took place in 2009. Dawn Marie Viennes was born in March 1970. She and David Viennes met in the 1990s while she was still married to his first wife. David, originally from Vermont, was 10 years Dawn's senior, but age was never a factor in their love story. They met in the early 1990s while working at a restaurant and Dawn quickly fell for the divorced dad of three. They married in 1997 and their love only grew stronger with time. David and Don Viennes had been married for almost 12 years and decided to move to the charming suburb of Lomita in Southern California in 2008. Together, they opened a delightful restaurant called the Time Contemporary Cafe, which quickly became the talk of the town. Lomita, a small town in Los Angeles County, offered the perfect setting for the couple's new venture, with other small businesses located adjacent to their cozy cafe. The couple worked tirelessly to ensure their restaurant was a success with Don serving as the overall manager and hostess and David the talented chef, using only fresh, locally sourced ingredients in his scrumptious dishes. Despite the long hours, the couple never lost their spark and worked side by side with a small crew to create an eclectic menus of burgers, sandwiches, salads, pasta, and even tacos. With only two servers on staff, Don greeted the customers with her warm smile and infectious energy, making everyone feel right at home. David and Don Viennes were quite the pair, always on the move and searching for their next adventure. David already had three children from his previous marriage. One of the children, Jacqueline, or Jackie, was close to her stepmother, Don. Jackie was a toddler when David and Don started living together. Don and Jackie had a bond, and Don even taught Jackie a lot of things, including how to write cursive. During their marriage, David and Don moved around a lot. Initially, they landed in the beautiful Anna Marie Island, Florida, where they opened up their own little piece of heaven, the Beach City Market and Grill. It was a family affair with Don's brother, David Pepin, managing the restaurant. After this, when they moved to Southern California, it was like they had found their forever home. Don, with her gorgeous auburn hair and sun-kissed skin, looked like a true California girl at only 39 years old. Her perpetual smile and natural beauty made her a joy to be around. Her husband, David, was also quite the catch with his boyishly handsome face and charming demeanor. Even at 48 years old, he still looked young and vibrant, often wearing a baseball cap to hide his thinning hair. Together, they worked tirelessly to make their restaurant a success, and their hard work paid off. Everyone around them could see the love and happiness radiating from this wonderful couple, who seemed to have had it all. For years, Don and David Viennes had been the perfect couple in the eyes of their friends and family. Their marriage appeared to be a match made in heaven, with seemingly no trouble in paradise. However, looks can be deceiving, and beneath the surface, there was more to their relationship than met the eye. Beneath the surface of their seemingly perfect marriage, Don and David Viennes were hiding a dark and dangerous secret. Their drug and alcohol abuse, along with mounting financial issues, had created deep cracks in their relationship, and it appeared that domestic violence was also a regular occurrence. Dawn's friend Karen Patterson had noticed suspicious bruises on her friend's body on multiple occasions, with marks on her neck being the most recent in 2009. When Karen pressed her for answers, Dawn finally confided 
that her husband had grabbed her by the neck and choked her. Karen was understandably concerned, but Dawn dismissed it as just an argument that had gone too far. However, a month later, Karen received another distressing call from Dawn. This time, she was so scared that she locked herself in the bathroom during a heated argument with David. Karen immediately offered to call the police, but Dawn begged her not to report the incident. Meanwhile, Joe Kakashi, the owner of the motorcycle repair shop across from the Time Contemporary Cafe, had also become privy to the couple's troubles. David confided in him about Dawn's drinking problem, while Dawn revealed that David was too controlling. As the secrets continued to pile up, it was becoming increasingly clear that something truly sinister was brewing behind closed doors. As the fall of 2009 approached, Dawn Vien seemed to be hiding something. In the month of October, she asked Joe to hold on to $700 in cash, seemingly to keep it a secret from her husband. But where did the money come from? Was Dawn stealing from the restaurant's tabs? As tensions grew between the couple, David discovered the secret stash on October 18th and erupted in fury and in a verbal spat. David threatened to kill Dawn. Meanwhile, Dawn had arranged to drop off more money with Joe on October 19th, but she never showed up. She went missing on October 18th after her argument with David. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. Fear and uncertainty gripped the small community of Lomita as everyone wondered what could have happened to Dawn Viennes. Was she a victim of domestic violence and had David followed through on his chilling threat? The truth would eventually come to light, but the mystery surrounding Dawn's disappearance lingered like a dark cloud over the town. As the days passed without any word from Don Viennes, Joe Kakachi's concern grew. He knew David Viennes' story didn't add up, and he couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had happened to her. Despite David's claim that Don had simply left him, Joe couldn't help but notice that her car was still parked outside the restaurant, and when he asked David about it, the man had an answer ready. He told Joe that Don had left him, but it sounded like a lie. Joe decided to keep a closer eye on David, watching him from across the parking lot at his motorcycle repair shop. Meanwhile, David continued to spin this tale to the restaurant employees while trying to find someone to help him run the business in Don's absence. But Joe knew there was more to this story, and he was determined to uncover the truth, no matter the cost. David Vienza's call to his daughter Jackie came as a surprise, but it wasn't long before she found herself on a plane headed to California. As she landed, Jackie couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement at the thought of spending time with her dad. But as she arrived at the Time Cafe, she couldn't ignore the tension in the air. David told her about the problems he and Dawn had been having, and Jackie knew that her beloved stepmother had been a part of her life for 17 years. She couldn't help but wonder what had gone wrong between the couple. And then as memories flooded back to her, Jackie realized that Dawn's excessive drinking may have been a factor. She remembered a time in Florida when Dawn had chugged down a beer in a restaurant early in the morning and how she had hidden her drinking from her husband. As Jackie tried to make sense of it all, she began to realize that there was more to this situation than her father had let on. The suspense was palpable as she tried to piece together the puzzle of what had happened to Dawn and why her father had asked her to come and help out. With each passing moment, the tension at Time Cafe continued to build and Jackie knew that something was amiss. Joe Kakachi was on high alert at the time as well, and his suspicion was triggered by David Viennes' actions. Just two weeks after Don's departure, David was spotted holding hands with a young waitress named Kathy Gavin. David quickly promoted her to Don's former position, but that wasn't all. Joe witnessed a bone-chilling scene when he saw David's truck in the parking lot before the cafe opened, and Jackie Viennes and Kathy Gavin were seen dumping boxes of clothes belonging to Don in the dumpsters. At the same time, Karen Patterson, Dawn's friend, was especially concerned after hearing about David's history of violence towards her. Despite Karen's efforts to involve the police, they didn't seem to be taking it seriously. Dana Pepin, Dawn's sister, took matters into her own hands and filed a missing persons report. She knew David's story didn't make sense. If Dawn had really left, why hadn't she told her family? David Pepin, Dawn's younger brother, knew the couple well. He said his sister's marriage to David was toxic. As Don matured and wanted more independence, David refused to relinquish control, and Don became more and more unhappy. Just when Don's case seemed to be going nowhere, a new lead emerged. On December 4th, three months after Don was last seen, Larry Altman, a reporter for the Daily Breeze, filed a story about the missing woman. For his article, Altman spoke with David Viennes, 
who told him that his wife had stormed out after a fight, carrying only her purse. Larry Altman began digging into David Viennes' past and uncovered some disturbing information. Not only did Viennes have a history of drug-related charges dating back to the early 1990s, but they weren't just minor possession charges. He had been arrested for cocaine and marijuana distribution. Altman also noticed Viennes using the past tense when talking about his wife, Dawn. It was enough to make him wonder if Viennes knew more than what he was letting on. Could David Viennes be hiding a dark secret behind his wife's disappearance? New details had emerged about David Viennes' past, shedding light on his character and raising questions about his possible involvement in his wife's disappearance. While researching for his article, Larry Altman uncovered that in 1993, Viennes was convicted for distribution of cocaine in Vermont. Despite facing several years in prison, he was given a deal to turn informant for federal agents. But Viennes' trouble with the law didn't end there. A decade later, he was convicted on federal drug-related charges and fled to Mexico to avoid serving his sentence. Viennes eventually turned himself in two years later, but in 2005, he was again convicted on federal marijuana distribution charges in Florida. These revelations have led many to wonder, could Viennes' criminal past hold the key to Dawn's disappearance? As the investigation into the disappearance of Dawn began to heat up, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department turned their attention towards David Viennes. Sergeant Rich Garcia was appointed to lead the investigation, and it was officially classified as a homicide case in February 2011. In an effort to gather more evidence, a wiretap was placed on David's phone, and his daughter Jackie was summoned for an interview upon her return from North Carolina. Meanwhile, journalist Larry Altman was contacted by Garcia, who provided him with exclusive information about the discovery of blood in David's home. The investigator hoped that the story would put pressure on David, potentially causing him to slip up and reveal incriminating information. However, Garcia neglected to mention that the blood was too old and degraded to be useful in the investigation. But did this tactic prove successful in bringing Dawn's killer to justice? On February 22, 2011, David received an alarming phone call from his daughter Jackie. Jackie was panicking and told David she had told the truth to the police officers. David was suddenly drenched in cold sweats. But what truth did Jackie tell the officers? Let's delve into a quick flashback. It was after there was no clue about Dawn's disappearance in October 2009 that Jackie approached David, her father, to ask about Dawn's whereabouts. It was a night in November 2009, and Jackie was sufficiently high on marijuana, and David was drunk. David said he hadn't heard from Dawn and didn't know where she was. Jackie pressed him for information, but he seemed bothered by her questions. As he drank more and more, he finally broke down and confessed that Dawn was dead. His story was that she had come home one night high on cocaine and, in a fit of rage, he had to tape her up to control her. He woke up the next morning to find her dead, and he had disposed of her body in a way it would never be found. Jackie was left feeling uneasy. It all seemed too convenient. Why had her father waited so long to say something? It was all very suspicious. Jackie was caught between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, she wanted to do the right thing and tell the authorities about her father's confession. On the other, she couldn't bear to be the one to put her own father in prison. But things took a turn for the worse when David asked her to send messages from Dawn's phone, pretending to be her. Jackie knew it was a terrible idea, but she couldn't say no to her father's desperate pleas. As she typed out the messages, her heart ached with the weight of the lies she was helping to perpetuate. She sent two messages to Dawn's friends, saying that she was okay and was back in Florida, starting her life over. She signed it with the nickname Pixie, but Dawn's friends immediately knew that the messages had not been written by her. Pixie had been misspelled. Instead of reading P-I-X-I-E, it read P-I-X-Y. They shared this information with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. On February 22, 2011, Jackie Viennes spilled everything to the homicide investigators. She told them about her father's confession regarding Dawn's accidental death and how he refused to reveal where the body was. No body, no case. The same day, Jackie made a desperate call to her father. She had been questioned by the detectives and had no choice but to spill the beans about the confession. On February 23, 2011, Larry Altman's follow-up story made the front page. David Viennes realized that he was under investigation and the police were on to him. Panic set in. 
David knew he was running out of time. Had his drunken mistake cost him everything? David Viennes was in full-blown panic. He clutched a newspaper with a headline that declared, Dawn's disappearance as a homicide investigation. He ran to his girlfriend Kathy Galvin's apartment in Torrance, spilling out a sobbing confession that Dawn wasn't coming back and that it was an accident. Ignoring Galvin's attempts to calm him down, David jumped into his car and sped towards the coast. Galvin managed to jump into the passenger seat, trying to keep him from doing something drastic. Tears streaming down his face, David refused to listen. David's car, a Toyota 4Runner, was going over 80 miles per hour when a sheriff's deputy noticed it. The deputy tried to stop the car by blowing his car's siren, but David's vehicle did not stop. Then the deputy started chasing them. As David's car reached the point, Vicente Lighthouse and Rancho Palos Verdes, David pulled into the parking lot. It was a spot that overlooked the cliffs that plunged into the Pacific Ocean from 80 to 130 feet high. Galvin pleaded with him to stop, tugging at his clothes to keep him from doing something irreversible. In the meantime, the deputy had also reached the same location and tried to speak to David. But David was inconsolable, murmuring apologies and stating that no one would believe him. With a final apology, he climbed over the guardrail. As Galvin watched in horror, with Galvin frantically trying to hold him back, David stood on the other side of the guardrail, ignoring the deputy's attempts to talk him down. But before he could jump, he said something to Galvin, kissed her, and then pushed her away with both hands. The deputy moved quickly, grabbing Galvin and pulling her away from the edge. But it was too late for David, who took a few steps and leaped off the cliff's edge, plunging 80 feet into the churning ocean below. It was a heart-stopping moment as the deputy and Galvin watched in horror, wondering if David had met his end at the bottom of the cliff. A man who was once on the run now lay motionless at the bottom of the ocean. His fate seemed to be forever sealed. But David Viennes ended up surviving his suicide attempt and was rushed to the hospital for surgery. The news of his survival came as a surprise for many, including the family of his deceased wife. They had long suspected David's involvement in her disappearance, and his suicide attempt only reinforced their beliefs. On March 1, 2011, David spoke with Sergeant Garcia from his hospital bed and made a shocking confession regarding his role in Don's death. It was a moment of relief for Don's family, who had been searching for answers for so long. David Viennes coldly admitted to Sergeant Garcia that he had become violent for no reason, leading to his wife's death. He claimed that it was related to money missing from the restaurant and his wife's drug use. According to David, he had taped her hands and feet multiple times before when she got out of control, but this time he placed tape over her mouth and she had died of suffocation. When asked where her body was, David simply led investigators to believe that it could be found on the restaurant property. However, despite months of searching and tearing up floors, nothing was found. On March 1, 2011, David Viennes was charged with the murder of his wife, Dawn, despite her body still missing. Three weeks later, David requested to speak with investigators again and offered to reveal how he disposed of Dawn's body. His second interview with the police was recorded, and though he was recovering from his injuries in the hospital, he appeared coherent. During the interview, David told Sergeant Garcia a disturbing story that was unlike any he had heard before, providing chilling details. David's voice quivered as he revealed the gruesome details to Sergeant Garcia. He had to make it appear as if his wife had left him, and so he came up with a plan so insane it could only be imagined in nightmares. He transported Dawn's body to the restaurant and placed her in a 55-gallon pot with water. David cooked her body for four days, straining what he could out of the pot at the end of each day. But what about the remains he couldn't strain? Those were hidden in the kitchen's grease pit, and the larger portions? Double-bagged and thrown into the cafe's dumpster. David's madness knew no bounds, as he revealed that he had stashed Don's skull in his mother's attic in Torrance. It was a horror show straight out of a thriller, and Sergeant Garcia could only listen in disbelief. David Viennes' story was horrific and chilling, but some found it too difficult to believe. Despite this, Sergeant Garcia was convinced that David's confession was true. He reasoned that in a time of panic, people tend to revert to what they know, and as a cook, David's actions were not far-fetched. However, when David's trial began in September 2012, he recanted his confession, claiming that his admission of cooking his wife's body was simply a hallucination from the powerful painkillers he had been given after his severe injuries. But the details of his confession, like hiding his wife's skull in his mother's attic, 
could not be ignored. Although the house was searched and no evidence was found, the prosecution still believed that David was a cold-blooded killer, motivated by rage and anger. They argued that David should be convicted of first-degree murder, while his defense maintained that his wife's death was an accident, and David only panicked and disposed of her body. It was a gruesome trial that would ultimately decide the fate of a man who had committed a horrific crime. The trial began with the defense arguing that it was impossible for David to have cooked his wife's body for days at a restaurant without anyone noticing. However, the prosecution claimed that he boiled the body all night and hid it during the day. The defense further argued that David had not intended for his wife to die when he taped up her limbs and mouth. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury found David guilty of second-degree murder. They were swayed by his suicide attempt, which they interpreted as an omission of guilt. At his sentencing, David ranted and insisted that he had not harmed his wife. He apologized to Dawn's siblings and pleaded for a new trial so that he could testify in his own defense. David Viennes, a man accused of killing his wife, was denied a motion for a new trial and was sentenced to 15 years in prison for not speaking up in his own defense during his first trial. There's no happy ending. I don't think there's any winners or losers. Uh, two families have suffered tremendously and we will continue to. He has to pay for what he did. He tried to get away with it. However, four years after his imprisonment, he gave an interview to Dateline and provided his account of what happened on the night his wife was killed. According to David, he returned home after a long work week and found his wife Dawn was not home. He suspected she was out looking for cocaine and to avoid being disturbed, he decided to barricade the bedroom door. When Dawn arrived home around 3 a.m., she began pounding on the door, demanding to be let in. She eventually broke through and jumped onto the sleeping David, starting to slap his face. David claimed that he kept repeating that he wanted to be left alone to sleep, but Dawn continued to attack him. After that, she left the bedroom and went downstairs to the living room. David followed her and found a package of cocaine on the table, which upset him because she had brought the drugs home after she told him she wouldn't. Don became enraged when he poured the cocaine down the sink and attacked him again. To defend himself, David taped her arms and legs and wrapped the tape around her mouth so she could not scream. David left Don taped up in the living room and went to bed. The next morning he woke up and realized that Don was dead. He found her cold, stiff body in the living room where she had vomited and suffocated because of the tape on her mouth. David claims he did not intend to kill her and only wanted to calm the situation down to deal with it in the morning. He panicked that no one would believe it was an accident and he would be accused of murdering Dawn. So he decided to make it look like she had run off and left him. This time he said he placed her body inside three garbage bags and disposed of it in the dumpsters behind the cafe. David's account of events raises many questions, such as why he did not call for medical assistance after Dawn suffocated and how he disposed of her body. The interview provided some insight into what happened that night but it also raised suspicions about David's actions. David Viennes claimed that the story about boiling his wife was a hallucination brought on by injuries and painkillers. However, his story raises questions. Why would Dawn attack him upon coming home? Why did she go to the living room for drugs instead of doing them upon her arrival? And why would he follow her downstairs if he just wanted to sleep? Additionally, the idea of calming down a situation by taping someone's limbs and mouth together seemed far-fetched. Moreover, David had expressed anger about Don allegedly stealing money from the restaurant. Although he tried to downplay it as just a small amount, it's possible that Don was trying to save up money to leave her husband. Without anyone left to tell the story, the circumstances surrounding Don's death remain unknown. One possible explanation for David's actions is that he defaulted to his experience as a cook in times of stress, which is why he may have initially considered boiling Don's body. His daughter Jackie even testified that she heard him joke about disposing of a body in this manner in the past. Overall, it seems plausible that David may have acted violently towards Don due to her desire to leave him and his anger towards her alleged theft. As the sun sets on the sleepy California town of Lomita, the once bustling time contemporary cafe now stands deserted and abandoned. There is news that someone else bought the place. It was here that David Viennes, the friendly chef who charmed diners with his pasta primavera, worked his culinary magic until one day everything changed. Now, the cafe's Yelp page remains as a haunting reminder of the past. 
but the once bustling cafe had been replaced by a pizzeria. The scent of tomato sauce and mozzarella cheese wafting through the air. And, as David Vienne serves out his sentence, he waits for the day when he will be eligible for parole in 2023. But the question still lingers, did he really cook a body to dispose of it? Or was it all just a hallucination? The mystery of Don Vienne's disappearance and the truth of what happened at the time contemporary cafe may never be fully known. Do you think that Sergeant Garcia was right in his investigation? Or do you think that David Viennes was a master storyteller when it came to his wife's disappearance? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. And do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more gripping true crime stories.